Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. I'm Jesse Thorne. It's Bullseye. <laughs> Twyla Tharp is a legend in the world of dance. She's put on well over a hundred stage shows, either dancing in them or choreographing them. She's won a Tony, an Emmy. She has an honorary doctorate from Harvard. She choreographed films like Hair, Amadeus, and Ragtime. She put on her first show in 1965. So that is 55 years of dancing. She has been dancing for 55 years. She's 78 now, and she's still working just as hard as ever. And if that sounds extraordinary to you, well, it kind of is. But Twyla Tharp doesn't think so. She says the secret to staying healthy and vibrant is pretty simple. Just keep moving. That's the title of her book, pretty much. Keep it moving. Lessons for the rest of your life. Twyla talked with me from New York, and man, she is a firecracker. Let's get into our interview. Twyla Tharp, welcome to Bullseye. I'm so uh, happy to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. So why did you want to write a book about moving? And why did you want to use a definition of moving that is broader than just physical movement? I think that I've been making dances for a very long time, and sometimes people fail to attach dance to movement and themselves to dancers. And it has always been my conceit that dance is movement for everyone. And it happens that dancers are extraordinarily sophisticated and have many, many options uh, that most mortals, regular folk on the street, do not. But uh, that should not cause the audience to disengage from the fact that they, too, occupy a body. And so that in conjunction with a obvious fact, which is the older we get, the harder we seem to find it to move, uh, meant that, you know, put A and B together, you get C, keep moving. Did you start dancing before you can remember making a distinction between dance and other forms of movement? Yes, I think that's a really good point. Uh, my mother was a concert pianist and is an itsy bitsy teensy weensy. I used to go to her lessons and would just, you know, squirm, do the best I could. Can't walk yet, but you know, I'm dancing. Uh, and I think that we don't want to forget that's a capacity we have and a part of our arsenal. I feel like I have so little confidence in my. Oh, I don't want to hear this. Go ahead. I, that's it. I'm just saying I, I feel I have very little confidence in my ability to move in a way that anyone w would find aesthetically appealing. Oh, goody. This is going to be fun. How old are you? I'm 38. 38. Have you ever felt any differently? Have you ever felt yourself physically appealing? <sighs> I mean, I, I don't feel unappealing physically in general. I feel like I'm fine in that department, but I'm talking specifically in the realm of movement. I felt okay. I played some sports when I was younger, and I felt okay playing baseball, which was the main sport I played. What, what spot did you play? I usually played third base. Third base. Okay. That's a relatively static point. I don't want to tell you that, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So we even, had limitations even, as, even when we didn't, right? Even as a 13 or 14 year old, maybe my lateral movement was not my strong suit. Right. You're not out there being shortstop or something, are you? But I did a fair amount of, I did a fair amount of dancing in the arts high school that I went to. Okay. Okay. Good. What kind of dancing? Afro-Haitian. Okay. Jazz and hip hop. Uh huh. I never did any classical dance. I can't. Uh, I, uh, I wouldn't know what to do if you asked me to. Okay. Play well, that. we'll just put that to the side. Not important. So, as you're doing your uh, all of your jazz and your hip hop and your Afro and your Haitian and your Tahitian and so forth, how are you feeling about this? It was an interesting experience, Twyla, because. I don't not enjoy dancing. I wouldn't say it's a great passion of mine, but I don't not enjoy it. But I definitely was in a context where I was the worst of my peer group 
or close uh-huh. to it. Right. So you've always been self-conscious whenever you think you've been dancing. You've never just up and bopped around for your own pleasure. Well, I must have. I mean, like when my preschool teachers played Jump for Your Love by the Pointer Sisters, which I remember them playing a lot. Uh Uh-huh. Very good. Great song. Uh Uh-huh. I think we did dancing. I don't remember being self-conscious then. Right. And self-conscious is not necessarily a bad thing if you just translate it into self-aware so that if, uh, you know, we can realize that, quite frankly, get real, nobody is really looking at you, so you might as well figure out how you feel about it and just go there. And also, I am sorry, 38, man, is only beginning, (laughs) so you better get it together to start doing. What do you do every day, physically speaking? Type. Oy, that's it. You're kidding. I walk my dogs. I For play with my long? kids. How long? What kind of dog? How long are the legs on this dog? <laughs> well, that's the thing. My dogs are getting up there, oh. and one one of them goes about it goes about I'd say 250 yards, and then sit, she just sits down. <laughs> so this is it for you—an exercise? Uh, right now, yeah. What do you mean, right now? How long has this been? This has been since my third child was born, which is about two and a half years ago. Understandable, understandable, but we must push back against reality, and (laughs) we must create our own space. Otherwise, you know what? You will die, so make up your mind. (laughs) How did you feel when you were very young about the organized dancing that you did, you know, tap dance classes and stuff when you were young, I did it all, man. And I loved it all because I was, uh, I was taken with the possibility of doing something very, very well, whatever it was. Uh, And I was fortunate in having support in the family for that aesthetic. Uh, but also in having a relatively facile body that would do a lot uh, without having to suffer a huge amount of training. And so it was a relatively, for me, healthy step to push in the direction of whatever the form was, whether it was tap dancing or classical ballet or whatever, to try to become that thing Uh, which, of course, we never really accomplish, and becoming that thing alters as we age, but it is not lessened by as we age. It just is different. Can you give me an example of a way that you explored what your body could do when you were a kid, like something that you wanted to do and had to work to achieve or something that you found unexpectedly? My, I, I, was, I grew up on a farm. Uh, I grew up working in a drive-in theater. Uh, all of these things provide, with labor, wonderful results. I was gifted with many kinds of lessons as a child, and one of my favorite images of myself at work as a four-year-old is I got a little pair of point shoes, which really I shouldn't have had, but I had them anyway, and would put them on and would pull my little Red Rover wagon with comic books down to the drugstore where I could exchange them for other comic books, and I made very certain that everybody would see me running down on my toes (laughs) as a four-year-old. So that from that point of view, my metaphor already was that I was a dancer, not a kid pulling a wagon with cartoon books in it. Did you think then that you were going to be a dancer for your entire life? I didn't think I was. I was. Were you always sure of it? I've always moved from the time that, as I said, I was, you know, from with my with my mother playing music. Uh, from the time I could move, from the time I could stand, from the time I could balance, I've always been in movement. Would I attach the word dancer to it? Not necessarily, but it would never occur to me that I wouldn't be moving and and creating ritual in movement. What do you mean by that? Well, for example, uh, when my family moved from the Midwest to Southern California, we moved into a rather arid 
in place, and uh, there uh, was there were snakes, and there were tarantulas, and there were rattlesnakes, and I had a cat. Uh, the cat was being approached by a rattlesnake. Uh, I picked up a hoe. I hit the snake on the head. I draped it over a tree branch and started doing a dance to triumph over the power of the snake. <laughs> Fortunately, my father came and saw what was happening and got the snake before it came to. Otherwise, my dance might not have been able to materialize and, shall we say, grow onward. So when did you think, Twyla, that it was possible to be a dancer, not just as a way of being in the world, but as a way of uh, make, earning your daily bread? Uh, I have never really thought of it, fortunately, as being a way of early earning my daily bread. I've thought of it always as being something that I had to do and made the most sense to me to do and which would allow me to be most productive and give the most of what I had to our culture and that either I would you know, be able to support myself or not, but it was never about making money. Did you have an idea when you were in college of what kind of dancing you wanted to spend your life doing? No. I, no, I uh, have studied many different forms of dance. Uh, and as a you know, young college student, I was uh, hell-bent on experiencing as many different forms and shapes of dance as I could possibly access. Obviously, uh, New York, or maybe not obviously, but New York City in the 60s offered a phenomenal range of dance styles, techniques, intentions, uh, necessities, and I tried to expose myself to as many of these as I possibly could just to know what could be done, what was possible. And then when I decided that I would, for a, an assortment of reasons, some good, some bad, uh, start out trying to make my own dances, the only ground line I had was to try to find a starting place I had not already seen, nor experienced. How old were you when you auditioned to be a rockette? I auditioned to be a rockette probably when I was about 21, maybe 22, something like that. What did you think it was going to be like? What led you to audition? Well, at that point, I was having to pay some bills. So I was taking classes, uh, and some very famous dancers from the New York City Ballet would be in class, and they'd have, <laughs> it's a one o'clock class, 12 o'clock class, uh, and they'd have on like three pairs of eyelashes. They'd say, oh, what? hey, why have, you, why have you got on three pairs? Because we got to get back to the show. They were supporting themselves at the City Ballet, and we're talking principal dancers here by taking a job at Radio City. That's what paid their bills. So what was it like when you auditioned? Well, you know, I did my best. I did quite well. I had a very strong technique. They were impressed. Good legs, uh, good proportions. Uh, so uh, as I say in the book, uh, I was called to the table in the front of the room, young lady, your fuetes, which they were excellent, very good. But could you smile? And as you can tell from my tone of voice, I'm not always up for smiling, and i that's the way it is. I don't... In other words, to me, dancing is not pretend. Dancing is real. So I walked out because I knew I couldn't pretend to smile when my body was doing 48 fuetes to the left with a double every third one. This is no fun. This is work. So I was supposed to make it look fun. I don't think so. How do you feel about that attitude now? Oh, no, you would have to do it. If you're getting the check, that's part of your job. <laughs> no. Uh, as a director, obviously, acting is a different thing. But for me as a youngster, as a dancer, I was not acting. I was expressing what the body could accomplish. I went to college pre-med uh, because I wanted to understand what the body could do, and I found that the study involved in becoming a physician was so intense, and in many ways I felt I could actually study the body better in a studio. How's that? 
because I could ascertain how the body uh, and the mind interact and how one commands the other and sometimes the other commands the one and why is that and how is that? And I think psychology in tune with anatomy is obviously engaged in that enterprise, but I've spent hundreds of thousands of hours investigating that question. We'll wrap up with Twyla Tharp in just a minute. When we come back from a quick break, I will ask her if she's afraid of dying. It's Bullseye for MaximumFun.org and NPR. It seems like you really like podcasts, but have you ever thought about making one? Okay, so we have a guide for you, especially if you're a kid in school and want to make a podcast of your own. Check out the new podcast from NPR's Student Podcast Challenge. Listen and share with your friends. Hi, I'm Joe Firestone. And I'm Manolo Moreno. And we're the hosts of Dr. Game Show, which is a podcast where we play games submitted by listeners regardless of quality or content with in-studio guests and callers from all over the world. And you can win a custom a magnet. A custom magnet. Subscribe now to make sure you get our next episode. What's an example of a game, Manolo? Pokemon or medication. How do you play that? You have to guess if something's a Pokemon name okay. or a Medi- medication. medication. First time listener, if you want to listen to episode highlights and also know how to participate follow dr game show on facebook instagram and twitter we'd love to hear yeah, from you it's really fun for the whole family we'll be every other wednesday starting march 13th and we're coming to max fun snorlax pokemon yes nice it's bullseye i'm jesse thorne my guest is twyla tharp she's a legend in the world of dance having choreographed over a hundred dances ballets and other performances She's 78 years old now and is working just as hard as she ever has. She even wrote a book about it. It's called Keep It Moving, Lessons for the Rest of Your Life. It's out now. Let's get back into our conversation. Early on, um, early in your career, that is, you were choreographing dance that was not set to music. Um, Why did you want to do that? Because I, from my musical studies as a youngster, knew that, know that people respond. Audiences are more comfortable verbally and with what they hear than with what they see. They're much more unfamiliar with judging, engaging just from what they see. So if I put a dance phrase on a happy piece of music, everybody is going to have one response, take the exact same movement, put it on a, quote, sad piece, they'll feel totally different. So my intent for five years was to study what movement alone could convey. And that you cannot do when music accompanies because there's a blend there, there are synapses, there are connections that will taint the experiment, if you will. That must have been hard. It was very hard, and we loved it. It was, we were very, very difficult. (laughs) We were not lovable. (laughs) There wasn't a lot of uh, rocket style smiling going on? No. No, no. Basically, we had a very famous deadpan, uh, and that's basically what we did. We considered expressiveness to be a betrayal of the physical reality. You might want to quote that. It's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice piece of business. I, I, I'm not sure that expressiveness doesn't exist within physical reality, though. Perhaps. But you know what I'm saying. So I'm being a little sarcastic and a little, uh, you know, we were young and we were being very, very extreme and we were carving out an area for ourselves that nobody else wanted, basically. And we were able to launch from that point. But that became an identity. And then you can either go with it or go against it. What did you learn you could do or not do that was different from the dancing that you had been doing to that point, which I assume was primarily set to music? No, not necessarily. I mean, I've been a student of dance from the time, you know, I'm a tiny, tiny child, and a lot of the time you practice exercises, and it has nothing to do with music. It has to do with the rhythm of the body. So it it was nothing strange to drop the music. Sometimes we used it in the studio. We just didn't perform with music. How did it play differently without the music? Well, you first of all, people, if they're... If there are junctions, uh, points in the movement where there are 
unison, for example, and it's done without music, audiences really do wonder, how can they do that? Because they don't understand or they are unwilling to grant the intelligence of the body and want to believe that it's the mind that controls it. And if there's no sound coming, how does that work? It baffles them. I'm but, baffled right now, Twyla. I'm sorry about that. You will have to go out and run with no earphones on for at least half an hour, and then you'll know what I mean. <laughs> Why did you stop doing that? Uh, because I had a child needed to buy diapers, and I knew that people would pay me much more money if I were more entertaining. <laughs> Do you like being entertaining? I love being entertaining. I'm a very good entertainer. I grew up on cartoons. My parents, as I said, owned a movie house, and I grew up working in the movie house from the time I was eight until I went to college. And my most important experiences in the movie theater, of course, were the musicals, but also the cartoons, because cartoons uh, have a very fast logic. Uh, the sound effects are extremely well utilized in relation to the action, and uh, as I said, they're fast. Uh, you have to keep ahead of your audience. Not too far, just enough. Do you like to dance at a, a party or a— No, I don't go to parties. What about a wedding? You must go to weddings. No, I don't go to weddings, although I have been to one or two weddings and do love the fact that dancing dancing happens here because it's obviously it's a very sincere expression of, of joy. Do you Did you participate in that expression of joy? Well, it depends on the person involved. You know, it, it, there are many circumstances. Shoes would be amongst some of the circumstances. What kind of shoes are we talking about? Well, you'd have to have comfortable ones is my point. In the days of attending weddings, I think I was probably wearing high heels, and they do have their restrictions. So I'm not a trained social dancer. That I do not pretend to be. And when I've worked on projects that required that element in, say, the film, uh, I've studied it and can, you know, can produce it, uh, but it is, does not come naturally to me. I never went to a high school dance. I was practicing at home. Wow. Now, talk about things that sound hard. That sounds hard to me, but was it hard for you, or did it feel right? No, I, I think that I have been for what, I mean, whatever the word shy means, I, I have had my share of that. I've also had my share of very, very uh, dedicated and disciplined parenting. Uh, and uh, social behavior was not on the agenda. <laughs> Are you glad for that, or do you wish the mix had been a little different? No, I'm not glad or sad. Uh, it, we all have our own backgrounds. We all have our own lives, and it's to us to maximize that. I mean, in other words, people often ask me, well, didn't you rebel against your, your lessons? Didn't? And the answer is no. I tried very hard to learn from these people as much as I could, not to fight them. Are there things that you miss doing that you can't do anymore physically? Well, which answer would you like? The one that says, I will find something new here? Or the one that says, of course, anybody who has been able to jump six feet off the ground is going to miss it when they can't. But there is always the remembrance of what that was, and there is always the moving in that direction and the sense that, okay, physically I'm not going that extra five feet. Uh, but look how grand that one foot is. Wow. Look, I always said, okay, I was a very, uh, I had many skills as a dancer, and I felt that I was uh, in some ways outside the human realm, that most people would not be have any sense at all of where I was physically. And I used to wonder, what will it be like? When I don't have this facility anymore, when I am a, forgive the word, regular mortal, when I'm more a normal uh, body in movement, what will that feel like? And ultimately, the big question, what is the one single movement you have left? Oh, man, this isn't a rhetorical question. Which one? 
<laughs> the one movement you have left. No, you keep doing your movement every day, uh, and as time goes by, you will find what one you have left. That's not rhetorical. That's exponential. What was the first time you got hurt badly? I've been very fortunate. I've had very, very few injuries. I had an injury on a foreman film uh, in, in, with a group of extras. I was dropped one time uh, from a difficult partnering move, and I have broken a couple of metatarsals, and I've torn a rotator cuff. And this is not a big deal for moving as long and as much as I have. When you choreograph... Do you imagine the movements in your own body or are you imagining the, you know, the dancers who are in front of you making those movements? Six of one, half dozen of another, I'm, I can work both ways. If I want a movement that is going to set a standard, which we will all address in order to allow the audience to see one thing a tried in many different ways, I'll do it on myself. If I'm working with a specific dancer, there's no way I can imagine what they do uh, other than to suggest try this, try that. I may think I occupy their bodies. I tease all the time about uh, the body snatchers and the pea pods, and I go in and I become, and in some ways I can become very close to, I can feel what a dancer's body uh, can do, can probably do, can maybe try, but ultimately I can only do what that dancer can do. So it becomes about presenting them with the right launching pad to go in a direction where, you know, something can be discovered. Is part of what you're doing like an uh, the, what an editor does, which is to say recognizing and forming the special things about the performers that you work with? No, it's not editing. It's I'm not sure that I can find you a comparable here because it's not as though they come in with the material done and show it to me and I say, take this out, put this in. Uh, sure. They don't have the material. Uh, so it has to be uh, it has to be derived. Do you think differently about choreographing work that is intended significantly to entertain and work that is intended significantly towards some other aim? Uh, like what? Something without smiling. Uh -huh. Very good. I, I understand about audiences. I've spent a lot of time. I've watched tens of thousands of shows as an audience person. And I appreciate that position and communicating to, to an audience. And I don't see it as selling out to work towards delivering something that can communicate to other people and have meaning. Uh, I often say, uh, if the audience doesn't leave our concerts, our shows, feeling better, we failed. And it's that simple, and I do believe that. On the other hand, I can also work in a mode where I'm going for the absolute, and everyone is free to watch it, but you know what? None of that watching counts. Only myself and the person engaging in that activity can say it was done. It doesn't matter what someone else says. I can work that way as well. Can you give me an example of a time when you worked in that in that way, in that latter way? Of course. Uh, I mean, the first part of the career was totally engaged in that fashion. And when we bring back any of the old rep, something like The Fugue, it's totally about showing the audience, it, allowing the audience to see what we believe is right. Uh, and I'm always amazed when audiences love The Fugue because I think they're going to walk out on it or be bored or whatever, and they're not. Uh, they are engaged by the enterprise, by the commitment, by the dedication, by the sincerity of the search. What are you searching for? What does it mean, the, the, what is right? If you have an ear and you listen to, say, a chorus, you will hear if a voice is out of tune. You will give me that, right? Sure. The same thing is true of movement. You'll have to give me that. All right. So it is a sense that the movement is in some way 
harmonious with itself? That it's correct, that it's righteous. And you want me to be able to describe to you exactly what that is, you would have to see it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're doing our best. It's a radio show, you know? Oh, you know what? I love radio. And why do I love it? Because it allows people to use their imagination. I grew up on radio. There was no TV. That's great. So if you would like to imagine, we could imagine a dance. We could imagine forces coming from the right, forces coming from the left. We could imagine them colliding. That might be a good thing, but probably not. So we can imagine them crossing. How close should they cross? As close as possible. We can imagine that, right? Yeah. That would be a righteous thing if that were a part of the overall intention of the work. Do you feel at this point in your life more interested in trying something that you haven't done before or uh, getting better at something that you've done pretty well but could be better? Both simultaneously. How's that? Think about it. Repeat your words and think about doing them both simultaneously. Something new and doing something better. They can be done simultaneously. What are you most excited about doing that is both of those things right now? Well, this is a question that uh, I often get asked, usually towards the end of an interview, what's next? And I always have a stock reply, uh, which is that I don't talk about it because there are a number of reasons. One, it's going to change radically before it actually happens. I would have lied to you. Secondly, we can talk about something or we can do something. So I don't talk about that which is to come, but basically because... I have a general sense, I have an intention, I have an energy, I have a drive, I have a desire, I have a love, I have people with whom and for whom I want to work, but the specifics will come to pass in real time. You work primarily now almost exclusively as a choreographer. You don't perform as a dancer very much. Oh, that's so untrue. Is I it? dance every day in the studio. How do you think these guys know what to do if I don't show them? <laughs> I said work and perform, Twyla. Uh, but... Listen, man, listen to me. Every rehearsal is a performance. Every performance is a rehearsal. Are you afraid of dying? No, what kind of question is this? We're doing, a, we're doing here a seminar on a book called Keep It Moving. We are not going to die. <laughs> Thank goodness, because I'm super afraid of dying. <laughs> Well, you know what? Well, go out and try it once or twice, and then you'll get over this fear. <laughs> Twyla Tharp, I'm really grateful to you for taking all this time to be on Bullseye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Thank sorry you. that I'm sorry we did so much talking and so little doing. Well, all right. You can make up for it starting right now. Twyla Tharp. Her new book is called Keep It Moving, Lessons for the Rest of Your Life. And in case you need video evidence that Twyla herself keeps it moving, the New York Times just did a profile about her, including a video of her dancing. And um, yeah, she, she can really move. Well, I have a link to that story on the Bullseye page at MaximumFun.org. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is produced at MaximumFun.org World Headquarters, overlooking MacArthur Park here in beautiful Los Angeles, California, where there was a film shoot in the park. Not an uncommon occurrence. A lot of great movies have been shot in MacArthur Park. The subject of this one, two guys wearing matching gray tracksuits, both wearing bright red shoes, with identically styled beards and man buns. Then later on, they changed into leopard print. Our show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio is our associate producer. We get help from Casey O'Brien, who I just saw with a giant electric piano in the office. Our production fellows are Jordan Cowling and Melissa Duenas. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW, though who knows? Maybe Casey's gunning for his job. Our theme song is by The Go Team. Our thanks to them and their label Memphis Industries for letting us use it. And one last thing, we have done a lot of interviews in the last two decades. 
If you want to hear another amazing interview about the joy of dancing when you're getting older, why not check out our interview with Dick Van Dyke, who is still a pretty extraordinary dancer now in his 90s. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. and Keep up with the show there, and I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.